Topic 2.2, Communities and Ecosystems. So I want to introduce you to a very important word in biology and environmental systems. The word is trophic, and it refers to energy. So we tend to think about things as organisms and plants, animals, so forth. But really, what we're looking at is energy and, and the movement of energy. So when one animal eats another, in terms of uh, environmentalism, what's really happening is there's been a transfer of energy. And that's why it was important for us to learn about the laws of thermodynamics. So let's remind ourselves where energy can be stored, and then we'll talk about how it can be moved. So ecological organization starts with a species. Many of a species is what we would call a population. So we have many fish here, for example. A community would be many populations, so many different types of fish or crabs or jellyfish all put together here. Now, so far, all we're talking about here are biotic differences, different types of organisms. Then when we get up to the next level, ecosystems, we're adding in the abiotic factors. That could be temperature, amount of sunlight, salinity, could be the size of the environment, the movement of the water, all sorts of factors there, elevation. And then a very large ecosystem would be called a biome. Later on, we'll talk about different types of biome. We're, for example, in a coniferous forest. And biomes are determined by three abiotic factors, latitude, that is their position in the world, rainfall, and temperature. And finally, there's one biosphere that contains everything, and that's the planet Earth. And so what we're going to be interested in this is how is energy moving through these levels. Well, there's only two ways that energy can really move. Fortunately, that makes things a little easy for us. One is photosynthesis. Here is a model like we learned in topic one to show how mass and energy can move through a photosynthesis model. Plants do this. Some bacteria do it. Some protista do it. And the other way is cellular respiration, which is kind of the opposite of photosynthesis, where we take energy stored in the form of sugar, and then we digest it and extract high-energy electrons to make ATP. This is done by animal, fungi, some bacteria, some protista. So the movement of energy is what we're worried about. Here is a trophic pyramid very simple one that shows producers at the bottom. These are referred to as autotrophs because they make their own food. And then energy moves up to higher levels of heterotrophs or consumers up here. But let's just start right down here because this is where energy enters in to the living system. It can energy can enter in a couple of different ways. One is you could get energy from the sun. And that type of autotroph would be a photo autotroph. Photo, that makes sense. Or it could come from inorganic chemical energy. And that would be chemo autotrophs. So some, some bacteria do that. So these are producers, autotrophs. They make their own energy, uh, make their own uh, food. And energy enters into the pyramid here. And then it's going to go up the different trophic levels. What are the trophic levels? Well, these are all called heterotrophs then, and there's several types. So the first type is consumers. That's kind of what we are familiar with. Those are that eat others. And herbivores would only eat plants. Omnivores would eat plants and animals. We're omnivores. Carnivores would eat only animals. And I know we have it here where it's the primary consumer, secondary, and tertiary. Uh, these don't have to correlate to be herbivores, omnivores, and uh, carnivores. It's a simple pyramid if they do, but it doesn't have to be that way. But there are two other types of heterotrophs. There are saprotrophs. These are basically fungi that uh, digest food like we digest it, except they don't have intestinal systems, no GI tract. So they secrete enzymes, which digest things outside their bodies, and then they absorb it in there. These would be mushrooms, mold, other types of fungi. And then there's detrivores. These are organisms that eat decomposed material, worms and so forth. Uh, we don't eat decomposed material. 
hopefully. And uh, detrivores are often referred to as decomposers. And so sometimes they're not included in the pyramid. In other words, energy goes up this way, and then matter is decomposed this way. Now that's an important thing we want to understand, that matter can be recycled, but energy is not. So matter, when animals die, they get decomposed, go back into the ground, can be reused again, but energy gets lost along the way. So let's stick to energy for a moment and try and do a matrix to figure out what the different types of organisms might be. So first of all, where do they get their energy source from? They could get it from light. That's where it started from, or chemical reactions. So if you go back here, these guys start off getting it from light or from chemical reactions. And then where do they get their source of carbon? So energy and then mass. They could get it from CO2 from the air or other forms. So let's look at plants, for example. Plants get their energy from light and they get their carbon from CO2 in the air. They are photoautotrophs. Animals, like ourselves, we get our energy from eating food, other chemical reactions, and we don't get it from CO2. We get the carbon from the food also. So we are chemoheterotrophs. You can put this all together and you can make a food web. So follow the arrows. Now, the arrows don't mean who eats who. The arrows mean which way does energy go. So let's see. Let's start with somebody who doesn't have an arrow going to it. Aha. Like grass is over here. So grasses transfer their energy to a grasshopper when the grasshopper eats it. Transfer their energy to an owl when an owl eats it. How do you figure out the levels? Well, the ones who start here are going to be autotrophs producers. Follow the first arrow. This would be a primary consumer. Follow the second arrow. This could be a secondary consumer. Now, sometimes, by the way, it could be more than one thing. So let's look at the uh, fox, for example. Producer to rabbit, primary consumer to fox, secondary consumer. But if we went this way, primary consumer grasshopper, secondary consumer bird, and then in that food chain, the fox would be considered to be a third level or tertiary consumer. The more arrows involved, the healthier the area is. The fox would like to have more than one food sources. So in other words, if something happened to all the birds, the fox could still eat rabbits and be okay. So energy is transferred. Biomass is transferred, but differently. Biomass, as we saw, can be recycled when uh, animals die. Organic matter is decomposed, put back in the ground, can be reused. But energy is lost. Every t each time you go from one level to another, primary consumer to secondary to tertiary, in general, about 90% of energy is lost. This is called the 10% rule. Most of it is lost through heat. So cellular respiration requires a lot of heat. But it is also lost because we don't digest everything that we eat. And some of the things that we digest are unabsorbed parts too, so they get lost. Now, how are we going to model this? We're going to model it by a system called pyramids. So pyramids start at the base. We hope the base is very wide, and they're graphical models. There's three different ways we could organize them. We could organize them by simply counting the number of organisms. We could weigh the dry mass. It always has to be dry mass. Or we could measure, as I said before in the previous slides, the flow of energy. That's what we call productivity. Let's take a look at the easiest one, simply counting the numbers. So if you go to an area and you then say, okay, these are primary consumers, these are secondary, these are primary producers, and so forth, how many do you have of each one? Okay. Now you'll notice that it gets smaller, but it doesn't necessarily follow the 10% rule. The 10% rule was only for energy, remember? And you're going to have a different type of pyramid in each uh, ecosystem that you're in. So we're counting the number of individuals. So in order to maintain these three guys up here, they need to have almost 6 million guys down here. 
you can see the problem that a lot of organisms will have. The next way to do it is biomass, grams per meter squared. Sometimes it's in kilograms. Typically on your test, uh, they will indicate the unit as grams per square meter per year. And you can see that this is a pyramid that kind of almost looks, well, not 10%, but it's sort of looking like it should. In other words, pyramids should not really be classic pyramids. If they follow a 10% rule, they would go from 100 to 10 to 1 to 0 0.1. They'd get quite short very quickly. Producer leaf down here, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. And we have uh, birds up here. I don't know if these are hawks. And in order to have the weight that they do, look at how much mass had to support them. So again, same problem going on in this ecosystem. And finally, we have the movement of energy. And you can see this one really obeys the 10% rule. So draw it like this. Don't draw them like a typical pyramid. You'll get that marked wrong. Now, look here. Look at how much energy has been lost. These snakes over here, primary, secondary, tertiary consumers, so these are also carnivores, in order to possess 10 joules of energy, there needed to be plant life that had 10,000 joules of energy. Wow, big problem. And again, energy is normally put in joules or kilojoules per meter squared per year. Those are the units you will lose on a test. Now, that's the way things should look, and that tells us what's going on in a normal ecosystem, but sometimes you have what are called inverted pyramids. This one looks like someone just took it and turned it upside down. This one looks like part of it's turned upside down, and then this one goes in the right order. What the heck is going on here? Well, there are many conditions that go on in an ecosystem that could change the way things look. So let's take a look at this one. Why the heck is this one uh, inverted? Now, this one to me looks like, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? no, no, no. Not quite sure if this is a number pyramid. Uh, pyramid of numbers. Okay, fair enough. Why are there so many guys at the top here and so few down here? And I would say simply because of size. The guys at the top, there's a lot of them just because they're really small organisms. So one big tree can support lots of little guys. Fair enough. What the heck is going on in here? Well, I would say that's what's going on in here is why is one tree here and lots of birds here, right? Again, size, but it also may be because uh, birds can fly and they move around. They, a tree has to stay where it is, but the others can move around. So that screws up our pyramids a little bit. Here's another one in inverted biomass. You have very, very big carnivores at the top here and you have small producers here, right? But the carnivores, remember, are moving around. And another thing which may be going on here is lifespans. These guys may live for a long time, and so they can eat a lot and become really big, whereas these guys don't live very long. So lifespan could be a problem too. So in other words, when you have inverted pyramids, you have to take into consideration uh, behavior. What is the lifespan? What is the size? Um, what is the mobility of the organism? And that can disturb what we would typically think of as a normal pyramid.